Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Millennial Investing Podcast. I'm your host, Clay Fink. And today I'm joined by Jesse Meekum. Jesse, pleasure having you back on the show. I'm very glad to be back. Thanks for having me, Clay. You were previously on the Millennial Investing Podcast a year ago, back on episode 80 with Robert Leonard for listeners that would like to check out that episode. For this one, I wanted to dive into your journey starting with your company, YNAB, mm-hmm. or You Need a Budget. I think the listeners in the audience will enjoy learning about your background as you have a very humble beginning. What led you to starting YNAB all the way back in 2004, which was now over 17 years ago? Yeah, it is crazy to think how long ago it is. Um, I, honestly, my main motivation, to be super frank, was money. So, um, my wife and I, uh, we've been married uh, just about 19 years now, but we had just gotten married and uh, we were both working student jobs at the university, super uh, low paying jobs, like nine, ten dollars an hour in that range. Um, I still had three years of school to finish a master's degree in accounting. And Julie, my wife, was wrapping up a social work degree where her job prospects were like 11 bucks an hour or something like that. So um, it was. I just knew that things were going to be super tight. So I had built a, a spreadsheet for Julie and me to use just to make sure we were monitoring our own spending. And um, after using that for about a year, I could see that it was working, but it didn't, we just still didn't have enough. Like we, we had saved and saved and saved and we were living so, so cheap and we weren't going to have enough to be able to do two things that were really important to us. Um, one was a baby was on the way and Julie wanted to be able to just step out of the workforce and focus on being a mom. So that was number one. So we would lose her um, full-time, albeit fairly meager full-time income. We would lose that. The other non-negotiable that we had is we did not want to borrow money for me to finish school. And so placed between those two uh, hard places, I I had the thought, well, maybe I could just sell this spreadsheet that we've been using and that would get us through. So we needed about 350 bucks a month to kind of ride us through to where we'd just end school. I'd be able to go off and get an accounting job and we'd have a full-time real income and you know, we'd be set. So that was, that was the, whole, the whole thing was we need an extra $350 a month. Incredible story. And it's crazy to think now today you have a podcast, you have a book, you have a YouTube channel, you have all these things going on on top of yeah. this. You need a budget website. Could you talk about your journey running the business? How has the business changed and evolved over the years? And could you talk about that experience a little bit? Yeah. I mean, it, that, that could be a, a two hour long episode, right? But um, you, one thing that's important to remember is you learn slowly. So when you compare now versus 17 years ago, it's this big jump. Um, I think now we have maybe 160, 170 employees around there. Um, we, we didn't start there. You know, if you would have thrown Jesse 17 years ago into leading that, I would have, would have just failed miserably. Um, we, the website was simpler. The app was simpler. Um, product decisions were simpler. Branding was simpler. Competition was less back then too. So, among all of those things, you have to recognize that while it looks like it's this big jump, it really is just very small steps, one to the other to the other. And day to day, nothing looks terribly insurmountable. Um, nothing's terribly confusing. It all looks like, okay, I think we know the next step and we know the next step from here. We need to hire this person and um, we should take the product this direction. Um, the main, one of the big takeaways though that I have learned is it really is people. You, you really have to make sure you are working with the right people that, are, that resonate with the core values that the company has. And, and then obviously, you've got to get product market fit. But you can have product market fit without the right people, and then it's a recipe for disaster. So of all the things I've learned over the years, that's the one where that lesson just kind of keeps coming back home over and over again. I love that you put such a big emphasis on working with the right people because you know we spend so much of our time working and you want to spend that yeah. time with people you really like. So you started YNAB part-time, as you mentioned. You're, you're even a student when you started it. And then you worked a full-time job as an accountant, which is a very busy career, yeah. especially when you're working at a big four firm. 
when did you know that it was the right time to make the jump and quit, quit your job and go full time on your business? I had two, two things that happened. One uh, was where I was, I was kind of ashamed as a, uh, as a, a dad fairly new. We had a, a two-year-old and a brand new baby, and I wasn't seeing him at all. We were working 80 hours a week at the accounting firm. And that's not like it was 80 hours a week. I would, I would leave around 6.40 in the morning. I would get home around 10.40 at night. Um, and it just kept going and going. If we didn't work Saturdays, it was a, it was a dream. you know. And um, it, was just a, it was a lot. And I was working on YNAB from about 4 to 5 a.m. in the morning, and then I'd go to the gym and then be gone. So I'm not seeing these two little boys. I'm not seeing my wife. And I remember one time, I feel like we were maybe helping someone move on a Saturday. And I don't remember exactly where we were, but my two-year-old did something that made me mad. And he is two at this time, right? And I, I got mad at him, like uh, in a... like over the top way. Like I really just blew up at him for, for a, a two-year-old infraction, you know? And my wife, Julie, just pounced on me. I mean, she turned to me like just claws out, like just laid into me. Like you have two hours with this kid a week and you're going to spend any of it, you know, yelling or getting mad or losing it at all. And I don't remember the details of why I got mad. I don't remember how mad. I don't remember what I said. I just remember that she, she just checked me on that. It's like, you, you have got to be kidding. You never see him. And this is what the relationship is like. That, that was a moment for me. I thought, okay, one, I'm so stressed and so tired and so just overworked that I have no fuse left. Like I, it's, just, it's like anything would kind of set me off. I was just emotionally spent. Um, and the other bit is my time was so precious that I thought, do I really want to have that situation where I'm, you know, I'm counting on one hand, the number of hours I have with my, with my brand new little kids. And that, that didn't work. Um, the other one in a quick way, kind of a quick story. I chatted with a very successful business owner as I was starting to think maybe I could make the jump. And to give you an idea, Clay, of how um, conservative I was or how kind of naive I was about the idea of you need a stable job. You know, you need a, you've got to have a stable job. In, in accounting, they had just drilled that into us. Like you work, you work, you get that stable job. And um, work, the idea of working for myself and providing for my family just seemed very risky. So I had that in my head and had been kind of trained on that. And I went and chatted with this, this successful business owner that I knew through my church. And he asked me, I, I said, hey, I'm making more money from my side business than I am from YNAB or from KPMG, my accounting firm. I probably shouldn't say the name of the firm, but it's one of the big four. They're all the same, you know, it's like change the name. But anyway, so I'm working there and I'm making like 45 grand a year. At YNAB, I was making like 90 and Julie and I were just setting it all aside to buy a house because it was, it was 06. So that yeah, was 07 at the time. So everyone was saving for houses back then. And we were planning on getting that house. He asked me three questions that I think are still instructive for anyone. Uh, his first question was, do you have any debt? That was number one. Uh, the second question was, how old are your kids? Which is another form of, of kind of debt. It's like, how much, how much are you bound to a situation? You know, and older kids would probably bind you a little more. So um, I said, they're zero and two. So he's like, okay, that's basically... No, no bounding at all. And then his third one was, is, would your wife be on board if she were to, you know, if you were to jump ship and do this? And I said, yeah, she would. And then he just said, Jesse, you have nothing to lose. You know, that's, that's it. So his advice, along with that kind of personal failing moment where Julie corrected me quickly and decisively, they, they both really helped kind of push me like, okay, I can give this a go. To be working 80 hours a week and building something on the side is just like an incredible feat in itself. Um, and you were just so successful at it, just putting you know an hour or so a day into this YNAB business and you're making more from that. Just, so just to think about how much more you could be making if you were to commit to it 40 plus hours a week is pretty incredible to think about. And you knew it was pretty likely that 
if things were to go south with the WineApp part-time business, then you could try and go back to the Absolutely. Exactly. Absolutely. Had those marketable skills. So was the transition difficult for you to go from that employee mindset to being an entrepreneur and running your own business? Or can you talk about that transition a little bit? Yeah, I don't think there was honestly much of a transition, or at least not one that I'm noticing in hindsight. And you got to be careful with hindsight. But I think um, I had practiced running the business, right? I had practiced it on the side with a fairly low stakes situation where it was just me and I had a contractor named Taylor, who's now my business partner, but it was, it was a simple operation. And so you were, I was getting my reps in of like how things work, how quarterlies work with taxes, you know, what it means to incorporate or not. Um, and what it means to, to process payments and just kind of like the nitty gritty things that frankly now are so much easier than they were back then. Um, There's so much more available for you to kind of spin something up and get started. The tools, the frameworks, it's all, uh, it's a little more, just a little easier to get things rolling. Um, Even like buying a domain back then was a little weirder than it is today. You know, just a little more like, wait, how does this go? So um, you just kind of learn the ropes. But I think that the idea of working something on the side, it's just a great way to have very low stakes practice where it's meaningful practice, but it's, you know, you're not going to lose something over it. You're not going to, you're not going to fail. You're just going to get some reps in. So I don't think the transition was terribly hard as we've moved from more, you know, from one, like 10 employees to 30 employees, like there's been transitions along there, but those are more just kind of plain vanilla organizational changes that that you have to make. Yeah, you know, there's there's no secret there. You just need to read books and then reread them and keep trying, you know. Although I don't run my own business. I'm responsible for many of the steps around this podcast. So sometimes it kind of feels like it. And yeah. for me, it's much different than my typical corporate 9 to 5 job since I'm doing this full time now. I've given you know, in a corporate job, I'm given these tasks and these deadlines, and it's fairly simple and straightforward what I need to do. And the challenges I've ran, ran with running the podcast is I'm responsible for a number of different things. And outside of recording and editing, I have to figure out, okay, what's the best time? What's the best way for me to allocate my time? You know, there's just like countless you know, things I could be working on to try and grow the podcast or expand the reach and things like that. Yeah. Deciding what is a useful or, you know, how one could use one's time. That is, that is tricky, like in life, right? Um, you want to make sure that it's, it's well invested, but we have to be careful with kind of spinning something up or starting a new business. I think I was given a great gift by not having so much information available to me as I started. So now people, they, you know, they want to launch a podcast. I mean, you're, you're well along your way, right? But someone wants to launch a podcast. So instead of figuring out what their podcast will be, or instead of starting to pitch guests, or instead of starting to record, they'll read how to launch a podcast. Like They spend so much time consuming the ideas behind the creation that they really don't create very often. And I, I feel like I was blessed by not having Hacker News or not having YouTube in, a, in its form now, at least. I mean, I can't, like, I want to go on YouTube and fix my swing or something and golf. And I'll be like, oh, I want to look and see how I do this. And then you find yourself 40 minutes later, just down the rabbit hole. And you're thinking, oh my word, what am I doing? And we, we do that where we feel like we use busyness as an indicator of production, where it's, it's not, it's just we're just spinning our wheels. So one question that I often ask myself, and it's, it's not a question I invented, but just, will this move the needle? Will this move the needle? And you'll find as you're trying to grow a podcast or market a book or build a blog or whatever it is, you'll find that what moves the needle is you doing uncomfortable things like asking for things, asking for the sale, asking for advice, asking for a link, asking for someone to come onto your podcast, asking for someone to promote your book. And it's not around um, tweaking this or that little nook or cranny in some deep corner of your podcast. It's, it's really the heavy lifting, the relationships, the meaningful 
actual value creation that's happening. And a lot of that doesn't exist on the internet. It exists outside the internet. The internet just facilitates it. So it's just, it's kind of a little bit of a warning for people. Just make sure that your creation over consumption ratio is proper and, and uh, stay away from ever, like even this podcast, like listen to it and then go and do like 10 X what you're listening, you know, or the amount you're listening. And um, otherwise we end up just kind of always consuming and never creating and never, never building that value we're looking for. I love that advice. Let's transit transition to talk more about budgeting and what you do, you're doing at YNAB. I think that now is a great time to have this conversation since we're currently seeing higher inflation and some people might be you know, seeing strain on their expenses relative to what they're earning. And they probably need, need to take a look at where their money's actually going. Yeah. And since you know budgeting as well as anyone else, I'd like to ask you, what is a budget? And maybe more importantly, what is not a budget? Yeah. Um, a budget is simply your truest, your truest of intentions laid out in some meaningful way so that your money can do the work of realizing those intentions. That, that is it in an abstract way. And I say it abstractly because everyone else thinks of it totally incorrectly. So it's really about you figuring out what you want most in life. What you, and that means like what you want most in life right now and saying, okay, this is what I want the most. And then you make sure that your money will help you realize what you want. That is a budget. A budget is not spending cuts. A budget is not necessarily uh, spending less. A budget is not restriction. It's not um, any kind of deprivation. A budget is not a, a bludgeon that you use against a, uh, you know, your financial partner to guilt them about something. Um, a budget isn't some kind of strict, stringent, inflexible um, external thing that you then blame when life, just normal life happens. A budget is just you intending with your money. And that's it. Um, so any, any other definition that someone has is totally wrong. No, I'm just kidding. But it's, it's, uh, it's you, you know, it's your money. It's just you, your money is just an extension of you. So it's just you again, it's just maybe on paper or in an app or whatever, but it's just you realized. And, um, I think that's why it never gets old to talk about it because we're talking about people and life and their energy and their work, um, all doing things that are su supposed to make their life and make them better. So I, I don't get tired of talking about it. Yeah, I think the intentional piece is important. When I was looking up your name, I found you on Twitter and I saw that you're really not active there at all. And that just tells me right there that you're just so intentional with everything in life, whether it be your money or how you're spending, spending your time. You have a very busy life with your own family and things like that. So I knew that you are someone that's just very intentional and I think the restrictions piece that you mentioned is also important to a budget isn't something that's meant to restrict your life and tell you, you can't go and spend money. You can't go and do fun things. It's just being intentional with, you know, this is how much I'm earning and this is, you know, how I'm going to save for these events in the future and ensure that my money's going where I really want it to go. Yeah. And if I were to asterisk that, I would say, it's your intention, but it is your intention butting up against reality, cold, harsh, absolute reality. So, you know, I can intend all day long, but if, if I don't make enough money to, to realize that, then that's, that's reality. So you, then you say, well, you need to fix your intentions inside your reality. And people are, are they, I mean, they come into this life in all kinds of situations and, and upbringings and my word, the dynamics, it, like we couldn't even begin to discuss all of those dynamics. But at the end of the day, you are dealing with reality and, and then reality has to kind of deal with you a little bit as you decide what you want out of things. And I'm not saying that we can totally change reality, but I do think that we can start to realize more than we thought of what we want as we marry those two together. So it's, it's not that we pretend that, oh yeah, I can have whatever I want. You can't, you, you can't, I can't buy an Island, you know, no matter how much I intend one, I just can't buy one. Um, now, do I really want one is another question entirely. So we have to be real about what our situation is 
and then what our true intentions are. Most people end up having a lot of the same intentions. They want to live comfortably. They want to have shelter. They want to have food, even fairly healthy food. They want to provide for their kids. And then from there, it starts to get a little bit more varied, but it's still, they're still all kind of same color, different stripes where people are saying, well, I'm really into this sport. I'm really into this hobby. You're like, oh, okay. You're just, you're self-actualizing a little bit. That's fine. Everyone's trying to do that. What we, what we don't want to do is pretend that there's some cookie cutter way that this is supposed to work. It's really more an introspective exercise than it is, uh, again, going back out and Googling, you know, how much should I, or when should I, and all of that. It's, it's really about you. And that's hard work to figure out what you really want. I'm trying to put myself in some of the listener's shoes. Say if someone makes you know, a high income or mm. if they're just like a natural saver, do they still need to use a budget or would a budget you know, help them with their finances? How do you kind of think about that? Yeah. I, again, a budget isn't meant to just help you save money, um, nor is it meant to help you spend money. It's just meant to have you have your money... Um, realize your intentions. So I would just go to a high income or you know, some, an anesthesiologist that pulls down 800 grand a year. And you're like, well, what do you intend? And they're just like, I don't want to work maybe always. I don't want to work 60 hours. Or I have a friend that's a very successful surgeon. And he just doesn't want to be on call. That's, his, that's a big deal for him. He's like, man, if I could get rid of this pager, and it's, I think it's still a pager, actually. If I could just get rid of this and not have to have it potentially ruin a weekend. That would be a big deal. And so he, he, his financial goals were lining up to where it was just like, okay, I just want to be able to say, hey, I don't need the on-call hours. We'll let someone else take those hours. And it's a pay cut, but one that he finds worth it. So his budget was just um, him saying, well, what do I want out of life? And someone that's earning a high income, I mean, do we really want to have that person be aimlessly wandering around with all those resources at their disposal. I think, I think high income earners need, I, I don't want to say need or even that it's incumbent upon them, but a high income earner has been blessed with high income. So let's, let's not squander that and not be intentional with it. Let's, let's make sure that the gates of the world and everyone in between me and Bill Gates are all kind of like saying, you know, what would make this world better? Or what would I love? Or what would make my life richer, truly richer? And I want to have my money do that. And in that sense, everyone needs that. And if you want to call that a budget or a philanthropy plan, you can call it whatever you want, but it's you intending something with your money. And high income earners have a great shot to do good and really make things happen in a way that others don't. I think they should jump on the opportunity. Hey everyone, Clay Fink here, host of the Millennial Investing Podcast. Today, I wanted to tell you guys about this exciting new investment tool called Titan. Titan is an investment platform that was made for everyday investors that want their money actively managed by a team of experienced analysts. With how hectic life can get at times, why not outsource your investments to the experts? They offer three equity portfolios and America's very first actively managed crypto portfolio. Since launching each portfolio, Titan has outperformed the benchmark in three of their four portfolios on an after fee basis. They aim to grow your investments by 15% annually. And at this rate of growth, this implies your money doubling every five years. My favorite fund is their flagship fund, which invests in the highest quality large cap growth stocks in the U.S. Join the smarter way to invest with Titan. All it takes is $100 to get started. Right now, if you sign up through our link, titan.com slash TIP, you'll get your first three months of investment management for zero fees. That's titan.com slash TIP for zero fees. Yeah, I recently had a conversation with Derek Kenny, who just wrote a book that was all about giving. And you know, someone that's earning a lot of money can really do a lot of good. And yeah. I encourage listeners to check out that episode. Now, you started YNAB all the way back in 2004, just selling a simple spreadsheet. And today you have this online tool where you can link in all of your accounts and do all these fancy things. So why did you end up extending the online tool and what additional benefits does it provide? Well, well, I'll say this, and I always say this anytime we're kind of promoting the software, maybe promoting it. If someone's, if someone already has seen their money do what they need it to do, you know, if they're, if it's just clicking 
and they're spending a very reasonable amount of time getting, making sure it all clicks like, I don't know, an hour a month or something like that. Um, then don't change a thing, you know, don't change anything. But if, if you're saying how, oh, what Jesse's saying sounds good, like I do feel a little out of control or I feel like, um, I just don't have quite as much intention packed behind my money as I would like to. That's when you can maybe analyze the actual system that you that you have in place. Um, that being said, the spreadsheet was just terribly um, it was just terribly uh, inhibiting on what you could do technically, even back then. And then you know, so we originally rolled out a, a desktop app where you'd like paste in a license key, and some people don't even remember know what I'm talking about, you know. Um, but that was a thing. And then these phones came out, and my first thought was, oh, these are cool, especially like GPS. That's cool. Um, and then you realize, you know, or you say to yourself, like, no one would ever want to manage their money on their phone, though. That's clearly like a computer, like a real computer's job. And and then you're wrong, you know. So you're late to the phone party, and then. Um, you know, Alexa comes out the Amazon Echo thing, and 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 now today I think oh no one would ever want to manage their money just talking to some assistant, and I'm wrong. I I know I'm wrong. I know, or no one's going to want to manage their money with like an Oculus VR headset on, and I'm just like no, I'm wrong. They're going to do it. People are going to do it, uh, and so it's really just us moving with the times. Um, if we were still a spreadsheet today, we'd be a nascent little tiny thing, and we wouldn't just. Be able to have the same impact that we have today. So you move with the market, you adjust, uh, you know, with the demands, with connecting to the banks and getting all that sensitive data in. That's not something that you love as a business owner to think. Oh, okay, we got to make sure that that's all perfectly buttoned up. But at the end of the day, customers are demanding it, and so you say, okay, we we need to make this happen. While all the while trying to say, okay, listen, people, just because we're grabbing your transactions doesn't mean you can just say, oh, this is all done for me. We want an active user that's engaged, right? So that, so that their money and their behavior are really lining up. In our previous episode, you and Robert covered your four money rules at YNAB. For our newer listeners and to refresh the longtime listeners, could you walk through those four rules for us? The first rule is, is to give every dollar a job. And it's just intention. Again, we're saying every single dollar you have, it needs to have an intention. Um, a lot of it's super simple and it's not so like uh, hand wavy, like, like intentions are a lot of the time just pay the electricity bill. And so you got to be like, a lot of it's just reality. You're just paying bills, you're doing your thing. But as you, as you recognize that you do this with just money you have on hand, we start to fix a common budgeting error where people will forecast their money and then they'll say, okay, I'm going to earn this much. And so I will spend this. We don't want you to do that at all. You only ever are allocating money to jobs that you actually have in your checking account. That's, that's key. We want you to feel the scarcity. We want you to run out of money virtually where you're allocating it to the different jobs so that you then feel like, oh, if I put it here, I can't do this. And if I, do, if I want to do this, maybe I can't do that. That's a zero-based budget. And that, that tension, the scarcity, like reality, butting up against your intentions has, helps you realize what priorities you actually have, what you really care about. And that's where the magic starts to happen. So one is to give every dollar a job. Number two is to embrace your true expenses. Meaning as you're giving every dollar a job, you're also looking ahead to larger, less frequent expenses like Christmas, vacation, property taxes, quarterly taxes, whatever. And yours are car repairs, even something that you wouldn't know the amount of you wouldn't know when, but it's going to happen. You, you consider those future expenses as well. So now when Clay's sitting there and he's like, ah, oh, should I do this? Or I should do that. You also have like future Clay there. That's like, well, what about the car, right? What about the, the, the tires are going to, are going to blow in three weeks, you know? And then if you're married or you're sharing uh, fa- uh, uh, finances with a spouse, then it's like four people. You, I have future Julie and current Julie, future Jesse, current Jesse. And all four of us are discussing things. Julie, future Julie is like, what about the spring break trip with the kids? where maybe current Jesse is like, we need to deal with this right now, right? That's, that tension is, again, it's just all of the correct parties at the table making decisions around the money. It works really well. The third rule is, we, we call it rolling with the punches, but it just means you need to change your budget as needed. That's it. So you're like a coach making halftime adjustments, you're, you're not a savant. You're not someone that can predict the future. 
you just are seeing, okay, life did this. So I'm going to bounce back and I'm going to change things a little bit. Budgets that are flexible, blast. Budgets that are rigid, they break. And so we want to make sure that we stay very flexible. The fourth rule, we call it aging your money. And Clay, for someone like you, it's probably not that meaningful, but for a lot of people that are living paycheck to paycheck, they live right on the edge financially. So everything about money is, is stressful. It's like if, if you and I were on a road trip and we're on like this windy canyon road and it's snowing, you and I both will be on like heightened alert, right? Like you're driving, but I'm watching. I'm, this is not a time where I'm going to be sleeping. And like when we talk to each other, we're speaking in a way that's a little more intense, a little more like, okay, this is a, this is a uh, risky situation because we're right along an edge right? A lot of people live their lives like that with their finances. And so it's no surprise that when a husband and wife are chatting and one person says, oh, you bought a new shirt. Well, then that suddenly means like something entirely different than just, oh, you bought a new shirt because they're walking right along a financial edge. So everything, every conversation, every little tiny nuanced thing is about money. And it's just like, catastrophic. So we back them off from that. Aging your money means you're going to spend a dollar today that you earned 30, 40, 50 days ago. And if you follow the first three rules, then you're aging your money naturally. Our software tracks it. It's a, it's a metric that we track. You know, People brag about it. Um, but at the end of the day, we want people to get away from that financial edge. You make better decisions. You sleep better. Your health improves. You don't eat emotionally. So you, you, know, you consume fewer calories and your conversations with your significant other are not so uh, emotionally loaded. So it's a win for everybody and everything all around. That's a recap. That's about as fast as I can do it. So, Yeah, I appreciate that. I think the most difficult thing for me around some of the things you mentioned is setting aside money for future me, like you just mentioned. I've usually just kept an emergency fund for any unexpected expenses. Like if my car tires go, I need to go get new tires, then I have the money to to go and purchase those tires. And another example is I rent an apartment and I'm not 100% sure when I want to buy a home, but I know I do at some point. Mm -hmm. So there's just uncertainty with what I'm going to be spending in the future. So it makes me difficult to say, okay, I want to buy a home in the future. So should I be setting aside $500 a month for a down payment, setting aside $1,000 a month. You know, that's um, where it kind of gets difficult for me personally, just where there's this uncertainty. Yeah. Yeah. I think where you'd want to check is you could set, you could start setting aside money for specific events like car repairs. And they're not super specific. Like you wouldn't necessarily have a car tire category and a car oil change. Like that starts to get a little, just not a lot of value there. But what you'll find is as you start to break things out, like um, house down payment, I would probably look more at like timing and I would say, well, about how much house do I want to buy? About when do I think I'd want to buy it? And then you could probably back into that one pretty easily. But the car repair one, home repairs, um, medical stuff, you know, maybe you want to save up to your deductible amount or whatever, that can all belong in one big emergency fund. What we find though is a pile of money without specific purpose tends to get raided. Um, And and so people will often be good savers, but they they aren't good at keeping the savings. And so it's a a little bit of a revolving door where they're like, oh, I'm doing really well. I'm saving until they have to draw on the savings. And they maybe have to draw on it because they're buying the new tires, totally legitimate, but they feel like, oh man, I'm, I'm my savings. So we want savings to have purpose as well. What happens is I I had an old Honda Civic for years and years and years, and we would put 150 bucks a month of maintenance into this Honda Civic. And at one point I looked at the category and there was like $6,000 in that. Bless that car's heart. It never broke down. Right. And I I go to Julie and I'm like that we have $6,000 in repair money for a Honda Civic that is worth $4,500. Right. And so, at, and that's a little late to the game as far as my realizing that it was on autopilot. We just put it in there every time. But I guess what I'm saying is you can kind of start to separate your emergency fund out more, more mentally or on paper. I, I would recommend on paper to be able to give it more specific jobs. And you'll, you'll find that you maybe are over saving 
um, or you'll find that there's maybe a blind spot in like a specific situation. What Wineabers find is that old emergency fund that everyone has uh, sitting in one pile. I would probably say, well, Wineabers, if you look at their budget, that emergency fund is just spread out across all of their categories. And so we're, we're getting to the same spot, except um, you have one person that can choose to, sp- to spend that emergency money on the new HVAC system. No one likes to do it, but they do it feeling better about it than the person that has to raid their fund that also has to cover these other unknown things. So one lets you kind of say, I can do this and I have everything else covered. The other one is saying, well, yeah, I can do this because I have the cash. I hope I ever have everything else covered. So it's a slight difference, but Wineabers also claim that they don't really have emergencies crop up anymore because they've given so much purpose to those dollars where car tires blowing out for someone else. They're like, oh my gosh, why me? Why does this happen? And for a Wineaber, they're like, well, yeah, I wish it didn't, but it's, it's okay. So that's, I, I, I like the, the savings, the emergency fund to have more purpose because I feel like it gives people more information to know if they need to make adjustments or if they can feel good dropping a bunch of money on some stupid HVAC system. You know, I wanted to talk a bit about your finances and how you approach your you know, like investments and your financial situation. I've heard you talk a lot about making your finances as simple as possible. Yeah. You've kept a lot of cash, you know, to save up for say buying a car or Mm -hmm. other larger expenses. And I was kind of taken away by that because a lot of the people I associate with are say cash is trash. You have to invest, Mm -hmm. have to, you know, make the most out of those dollars. And with the much higher inflation we've seen recently, has this changed your approach at all? And why do you take this approach of you know, having so much cash? Yeah. Um, it hasn't changed my approach as far as kind of our day-to-day. Um, if I'm going to need the money in less than three years, less than four years, gosh, even five years, I'm just like, ah, does, it's not that big of a deal. Um, it's not a lot of money that I'm missing out on by not investing in. That's one or not a lot of money to me. And, and I got to caveat that a little bit. Everyone has like an amount of money where they're, they say like, oh, that's not, that doesn't matter to me. It's immaterial. Bill Gates' number is bigger than my number, you know? And my number is bigger than my number was when I was 20, like significantly bigger, right? So we have to kind of recognize everyone has a material, like a threshold for what's, what matters. And a lot of times I'm just optimizing for something else. I'm just not optimizing for more money. I'm optimizing for less headache, less mental overload or overhead, um, less to think about, less to track, uh, fewer emails to get that say your statement is ready this month. Like things like that. I'm just like, I don't want that noise. I just, I want things quiet and, and pretty darn tranquil. Um, it's less for me to communicate with Julie about when, you know, she and I are sharing all these finances and if I introduce all these moving parts, that's just one more thing that we'd have to communicate and heaven forbid she and I both meet our demise and the kids would have to untangle all that. It's like, I just, simpler is better. Um, but I'm optimizing for simpler and other, someone else might optimize for money. And that's, that is totally okay. But you know, we both just nod at each other and be like, oh yeah, you're right. You know, cause we're both optimizing for what we're, what we're wanting. So I don't lose any sleep over, um, over that. I used to, totally do it differently. Uh, you know, as a 25 year old, it was like, I'm going to get my high interest savings account. I'm going to get all that money in there. But now you look at what we get paid. I mean, it was bad back then. It's, it's way worse now. So, um, yeah. And inflation will do what it does. Um, I'm the stock market is pretty good at hedge on inflation. Real estate's a pretty good hedge on inflation. Um, but what, you know, what, what else do you do there? Uh, working is a good hedge in inflation. You know, wages are a pretty good hedge. Um, so as a business owner, I'm watching wages go up and I'm thinking, okay, you know, we've got to stay competitive in a market. So wages are a pretty good hedge there. Um, but yeah, it's, I hope it doesn't last. It seems a little hot, you know, but I'm out of my expertise there. I'm curious, what has your investment strategy been over the years and how has that maybe changed? Yeah, I... I had a moment. Um, I used to follow really standard advice, like you know, have as many as you know the percentage of bonds that are your age, right? So if you're 20, you should have 20% bonds, 80% stocks, and you do that. At around 
I think I was probably 32, 33. I realized that my, I was watching the market a lot and I, and I'm, and I'm like a passive investor guy through and through. Um, well, with one caveat we can get to, but I, I realized that I was stressing me out and I realized that my allocation, my risk tolerance was way different than how I was actually invested. So I pulled way back. I went a ton into bonds. I went a ton into like, and I'm like, like bond index funds, tips, uh, basically those two were big. Um, and so I think I'd have to look, I'll bet I'm like 10% in equities, probably 50% in bonds, uh, and about 30% in real estate. The rest is in cash, um, or Bitcoin actually. And then, um, but I realized that my, my risk was all in my business. Like I actually hold like 99% equities really. And it's all in one company. So it's, ex- it's extremely risky. And if you were to be like, Hey, Jesse, I have this idea. I'm going to invest in all in this one stock. I'd be like, man, you're crazy. You're crazy. Don't do it. Clay, don't do it. You know, but we all do invest in the thing we know the best, which is usually ourselves and our career. Right. Um, and so I've done that. So I'm, I'm actually heavily weighted in a single company. And my job is to make the rest of it that I can pull out every once in a while safe. So that if the company were ever to just totally crash and burn all my fault, that at least I'd have something to you know land on. Um, so that's, that's why I'm allocated that way. If I didn't own a business, I think my risk tolerance would be, would shift not entirely the other direction, but quite a bit more in, into onto the risk side. I take it's tremendously risky what, what I'm doing now. So, yeah, I think it's really important that you're doing what works best for you and what helps you sleep well yeah. at night. It reminds me, one of the founders of TIP, Preston Pish, he is heavily invested in Bitcoin, which you just mentioned. And a lot of people might look at that and say, hey, he's heavily invested in Bitcoin. Maybe I should be too. But right. the better is that he owns a business. So even if Bitcoin is an investment that didn't work out. He still has a business that's producing cash flows and is providing him that income. So you have to look at the big picture, you know, yes, one might absolutely. Look at you and say, Hey, you're hyper conservative with your um, liquid assets. You have a lot of bonds, but what they might not look at is you have this company that's producing these key free cash flows and, you know, has this level of risks to it. Yeah. That's risk to your overall portfolio. So I think looking at the big picture is super, super important. Yeah, it's the only one you can look at. You, it's fun to get into the details and to think, oh my gosh, that person's crazy. Like that's good entertainment, but it's not good for guiding investment principles. My, I wanted, uh, Matthew that works for YNAB, he's one of our support specialists and used to be a, a financial advisor in a formal life. And he, he, he often will tell people you need to have an investment plan written down and revisit that. Like, why are you invested the way you are? So often we forget why, and we just get caught up on looking at someone that, you know, is is a Bitcoin millionaire or whatever. And it really throws you off because you have this serious FOMO and that FOMO is not a guiding investment principle, you know? So, um, yeah, have it written down, revisit it often. If you need to make a change, make a change, but you know, you're doing it with a little more rationale behind it and not just reaction to, you know, CNBC or whatever. Now that you've been a successful entrepreneur for many, many years now, is your focus still on YNAB or have you stepped back a bit now that you're more financially secure and the business is doing very well? I have not stepped back more. I, I'm no longer CEO. So I did step back from that. I didn't want to have the management of it. I, I handed the reins to Todd uh, Curtis, who's a more capable CEO and he's been with me for 10 years. Um, and he kind of grew up in the whole business. But um, I wanted to focus more on evangelizing, like what we're doing right here. And I want to focus on convincing businesses to buy YNAB for their employees as a benefit. And so I'm kind of on one little team inside YNAB and it's been fun just to be back kind of in a smaller little uh, bit of the company instead of worrying about the entire thing. Of course, I worry about the whole thing, but it's in capable hands and I get to kind of focus on this one little thing. It feels a little bit like it did back in 2006 or seven, where I could just kind of like go, go. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm still very much in it. I, you know, work normal hours. Um, 
and still love it. So until I stop loving it um, and or stop learning from it, um, I'll just keep doing what I'm doing. Very cool. And it's really cool just hearing your story of the humble beginnings and how far you've come over the years. Before I let you go, can I ask you, what are some of the books that have had a huge impact on you? And they don't have to be financially or budgeting related. What are some of the books that have had a big impact? Yeah, one of my, I mean, business book wise, I can rattle off a lot. I've really gotten a lot of, um, a lot of help from a book called Traction. Uh, that's just, it's a good basic business book. There's a really good book called The Goal that's a fable that I loved. Um, and I really like uh, Andy Grove, who was the Intel CEO. High output management is excellent. Um, ben Horowitz's The Hard Thing About Hard Things is an excellent business book. I just love those. Finance books, I love Your Money or Your Life by Vicki Robbins uh, and the late Joe Dominguez. That, that book, it just had, does such a good job of framing like what money really is. It's a representation of your energy in your life. And I love that. Um, the Richest Man in Babylon, I read when I was 14. And I was like, this is, this is a good idea. you know. So I'll always be grateful for that book. Um, I love anything by Taleb. So like anti-fragile, I love that book. It's that concept of something anti-fragile is really, really useful in all things, not, not just money, but it is tremendously applicable with, with money. Um, and then lately I read a book called 4,000 weeks that I really enjoyed. That's it's supposedly about time management, but it's really about kind of confronting how finite we are and having it frame our ambitions to have them maybe be a little more right-sized or human-sized. Um, so it's kind of time management, but philosophical. And I've, I'm, I'm already, uh, I read it, liked it, and then restarted it immediately to, to dive back in. So that's a recent one that I've gotten a lot of mileage out of, but I could, I could go on and on. I mean, I have a whole laundry list of books, but those are a couple that are top of mind. Yeah, those should be some good starters. I'm going to have to dive into a few of those myself. So I'm going to be pretty busy over the next few weeks. <laughs> Before I let you go, Jesse, where can the audience go to learn more about you and YNAB? So if, as you mentioned, I'm not really on any social media by design, but, uh, and people can email me, jesse at ynab.com if they have a question. I'm happy. I, I, I'll answer Monday or Thursday. Um, and then they can obviously go to ynab.com and, and check us out there. We're on YouTube. We're heavily active on social media as a team. We, we do great there. Um, even if people just follow us on Instagram, we have a Friday finds that's super funny. Some people don't even go to us for the budgeting. They go to us just for the Friday finds. Hopefully, eventually, we'll get them to come over to the budgeting side. But um, we're on all the social stuff, and, and you can follow us there. We're, we're just... Uh, yeah, we want to we want to convince people, persuade people that um, budgeting is just about you really wanting money to con continually have a positive impact in your life and have it really line up with your intentions. And if you do that, you'll feel that you have a financial peace that didn't come from more money. It just comes from alignment of your priorities and your money. Awesome. I'll be sure to link all those resources in the show notes for anyone that's interested. Jesse, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for having me on, Clay. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on our next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts about this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below.